Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. I think it might be my birthday. We get to do a baptism, we get to take the Lord's Supper, we get to preach. It was a big day for me. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, so my name's Travis. I'm the singles minister here at Park City's uh, Baptist Church, and I've probably met some of you. Uh, would love to meet more of you. Uh, so something that a lot of people probably know about me, and, and maybe you don't know uh, specifically, uh, I spent about eight years in the Army being an Army chaplain and an Army chaplain candidate. And one of the, the components of becoming an army chaplain is that you have to be endorsed by a denomination or by, a, by an endorsing agency. And so I grew up in the Baptist church, and so I was endorsed by the SBC. Actually, it was the North American Mission Board that is their particular endorsing agent. And uh, I went off to training in 2008, and it was specifically for chaplains, which all that you need to know about that is we didn't handle weapons, and it was a whole lot easier than most people's basic training. And uh, we would actually, and I'm about to tell you why it was easier, uh, we went out every Friday night for steak dinners. <laughs> Me and the other chaplain candidates. And so it was a really cool opportunity. I got to hang out with other chaplains from uh, different backgrounds and different, uh, even different faiths. And so it was really a neat experience uh, to, to do that. And so we'd go out every Friday and we'd kind of have uh, time to talk. Well, the first time we did this, we ran around the table and we talked about all the different denominations we came from. And the first person let off, and he said his name. And he was from the Presbyterian background. I thought, oh, that's cool. That's the, you know, that's kind of John Calvin-y. Like, that's, that's, you've got that history going on, and, and like, y'all are seen as really intelligent. Like, that's really cool. And then, then the Catholic guy got there, and I was like, wow, that's, that's neat, because, like, you have to be a priest. So he's, he's going to be celibate for the rest of his life. I'm like, that's a commitment I couldn't make. Like, <laughs> dude, you were, you're a stud. And we kind of kept going around the table. And then we got to me. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I'm like, I'm going to have to tell all these people that like, I'm a Southern Baptist and all the, the stuff that goes with that, right? Uh, they're probably going to think that like, I don't like to dance uh, and, that I, and I look down on people that dance, even though I occasionally bust a move and have okay moves. <laughs> they're probably going to think that when they go to the bathroom, I'm going to like grab their, their water and sniff it and make sure it's not alcoholic. <laughs> like This is all the things kind of going through my mind. And to some extent, I'm not ashamed of Christ in that moment, not at all. I'm surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'm almost uh, concerned and even a little embarrassed for the way either my, my tradition has portrayed itself in some cases, and in some ways that my tradition has been portrayed uh, in our country and in our society. And so uh, I'm kind of weighing out how to bring that up. And so what I wind up saying is, well, I'm Travis and I'm a Southern Baptist, but I'm not one of those Southern Baptist. That's kind of how I, I, I said it. But I wonder if many of us kind of deal with the same issue. And maybe it's not just being Baptist, although that might be a part of it. Maybe it's even just being Christian in your workplace, in your school, in your life. You might feel this sort of tension, this pull in, in two different ways of feeling like, I want to be uh, uh, committed and faithful to the, the word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, I don't want people to look at me like I'm Amish or that I'm from some lost world way back when that's not moving on with the rest of society. And so there's this tension, and because our culture values comfort, feeling tension is alien to us. We don't like it. And I would argue that as a Christian, if you're feeling tension in there, you're probably exactly where God wants you to be. Some of you might feel embarrassed, feel ashamed for the way that maybe even some Christian leaders in our country have spoken out in favor or against certain things. And you might feel like, ah, I want people to know I'm a believer, but I don't want them to think I'm that kind of believer. I almost have to make several qualifiers, hand people like an eight-page written paper, single-spaced, explaining what it is that I believe and why it's not what other people believe. 
And so what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how we can engage the culture around us as we live in exiles. And that's kind of the biblical term for what I'm talking about, is being a people group that don't seem kind of native to the culture around them. We've kind of, as Christians, we have different views, different values, different viewpoints, and even different morals than the rest of the society around us. And I want us to talk about how we can be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ while still being what I would call witty and winsome to the culture around us and making the gospel of Jesus Christ attractive and something that they want and that's something that they pay attention to. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you don't get anything else, this is kind of our main point for the day. Guided by wisdom and giving grace to all, we will serve our community or our city. So guided by wisdom and giving grace to all, we will serve our community or our city. And what I want to do is I want to break this sentence down into its three components. So guided by wisdom, giving grace to all, and then serving. I want us to look at Colossians 4, 5 to 6. That's where we're going to spend a lot of our time. And then we're going to wrap up in Jeremiah 29, 1 to 7. Sorry, we're not getting to Jeremiah 29, 11 today. That probably disappoints some people. But that's where we're going to be. And let's look at being guided by wisdom. We're going to start in Colossians 4, uh, verse 5. And what I want you to, to pick up from this verse is the way that wisdom is portrayed to the Colossian church. It says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Walk is, is a verb that is frequently used in all of Scripture. Paul uses it a lot. Other writers use it a lot. And it basically just means live your life this way. Conduct yourself this way. So he says to walk in, uh, what does he say? He says to walk in good deeds. He says to walk in eternal life. He says to walk in love. He even says to walk in Christ, which all of those are great things. But here he says to walk in wisdom. Why wisdom? Why not something else? My guess is it's because it's dealing with outsiders, people who are not of the faith, people who are not believers. And so rather than the primary thing Paul says to do, he doesn't say walk in love towards outsiders, although that's very important. He doesn't say walk in good works towards outsiders, although that is important. He says to walk in wisdom. And wisdom has to be a characteristic of the way that we live our life. That walk is like a consistent, continual thing. I can't just take on and take off wisdom. It's either something that I have or something that I don't have. You don't get to act foolish Monday through Friday, and then on Sunday you get to put on your, your wise hat here at church and, and look like you're full of the gospel. That's not how wisdom works. That's not how wisdom works. We need to have wisdom as a way of life. And it's a way of life for us as believers because Christ himself is full of wisdom. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, it says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So I think based on this passage, do you know who I think the wisest people on earth should be? Believers people who follow Christ. Because if you are a believer in Christ, you are somebody who has looked at Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and you've said, I'm a sinner. I can't keep God's law perfectly. And you've said, but Jesus Christ did. And based on his death, burial, and resurrection, he has paid the price for my sins. And so if I put my hope and faith and trust, if I identify myself with his sacrifice and his life, then his work counts for mine. And then the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. You know what the Holy Spirit's role is, one of his primary roles? It's to make you more like Jesus, which when I read 1 Corinthians 1, that means make me more wise. Make me more like Christ. That's called sanctification. It's a wonderful term that means becoming more like Jesus. The world around you is eager to see people who are full of wisdom. Because right now it looks like our world has thrown wisdom out the window. So wisdom is a way of life. Well, Travis, what do you mean by wisdom? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> wisdom is found in the scriptures. This isn't wisdom as the world defines it. Remember, back in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that, that the, wisdom of the, the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. It doesn't make sense. The fact that our Messiah would come and let himself die doesn't make sense to people that don't have Christ as their Savior. 
So what wisdom are we talking about? Well, I think James 3, Jesus' brother wrote a, wrote a letter. And in James 3, he gives us some insight into what godly wisdom looks like. Wisdom that's found in the scriptures. It says, starting in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? And then James starts listing out qualities that make you wise or indicators of wisdom and things that aren't. By his good conduct. Let's start there. Good conduct is an evidence of godly wisdom. It's good conduct. What does that mean? It means the new life that Jesus Christ has given you shones forth and people see it. And so you are maybe a little bit more careful about things that you approve of and disapprove of. You lead a life of holiness and purity, and even to some extent, I know this may sound legalistic, but even moral life. It's not what I want it to sound like, but I think it can sound like that. Let's keep reading. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Meekness of wisdom. Another word we use there is humility. God's wisdom should not put you in front of other people. Oftentimes, the wisdom of the world says, do what you can to get ahead. Stomp on people, push them aside, make sure that you do whatever you got to do to take care of you and yours. But God's wisdom says, put other people in front of you. Don't be divisive. Be united. Come together. And God's wisdom figures out ways to make people go together. Jews and Greeks, no longer slave nor free. No, everybody coming together under the umbrella of Christ. And then he explains what wisdom doesn't look like. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That's a big word. For where je jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And then he goes back to talking about what godly wisdom is. The wisdom from above is first pure. Pure. This means holy, set apart, righteous. This means that some things that the world does, we don't do. Maybe it shows up in the way, the jobs that we have. We won't take certain jobs because we can't guarantee that we won't have to fudge on our Christian values. Maybe it's the way in which we entertain ourselves. What shows do you watch? What movies do you see? How much time do you spend watching sports? That one cuts me. Let me ask you this question. Are you going to go home tonight and watch Game of Thrones? I don't see how that's pure. I don't see how that's holy, and it's not just because of the sex. It is violent, and it is, worst of all, it is a hopeless show. I can't watch things that don't have hope, because that is not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about hope. So I challenge you, believers, if you want to seem different from the rest of society, at the cooler tomorrow, tell people, yeah, I missed the episode of Game of Thrones this week, and here's why. Keep reading. It's pure. It is then peaceable. God's wisdom shouldn't lead us into shouting matches with people on the other side of the aisle. God's wisdom should lead us to love and care for the people around us, even if they have different opinions and different ideas than we do. It should be peaceable. There's a difference between righteous indignation, calling out something that's wrong and being angry about it because it is wrong, and being a jerk. There are differences there. If you have a hard time figuring out what that is, be silent for a while and pay attention and then, then start speaking. That's just some wise counsel maybe there. It says next to be gentle. This means not insisting on every single right that is allotted to you. Now, rights are important, and I believe in fighting for the rights of other people. But when we insist on every right that's due to me because it's my right, that's not being Christian. That's not being gentle. Again, that's being selfish. I can't have my rights infringed at all. Well, Jesus laid aside his rights as king and ruler of the universe. Maybe we should do the same in order to advance the kingdom of God, advance the gospel, and in order to advance the rights of other people who have their rights trampled more often than we do. Next says open to reason. This is one of my favorite ones because Christians are super known for being open to reason. <laughs> like we're like the most open-minded group of people ever. That's one of the stereotypes, right? We're super closed-minded. This basically just means be willing to listen. It doesn't mean you have to agree with the people around you, but be willing to listen. Be willing to listen. Full of mercy and good fruits. 
Wisdom should lead you to display more and more and more and more and more the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Good fruit should be born out of your life. You should become more merciful as you are wiser. Again, Jesus' life was full of this, full of mercy and full of good fruits. And then lastly, impartial and sincere. This means not jumping to judgment right off the bat, like meeting somebody and immediately like categorizing where they fit in your scheme. Now, sometimes we do need to make judgment calls about the people we spend time with. Maybe there's somebody we spend time with that is bad for us, that impacts our Christian walk negatively, that maybe we struggle with a certain addiction and they encourage that addiction in our lives. Maybe we need to withdraw. Got it. But you don't bat lead off with judgment. Lead off or judgment should be a little bit lower in the batting order. And that wisdom needs to be applied to the lives of other people. It needs to be applied toward the lives of other people. Let's go back to Colossians. Going back to Colossians, it says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. The best use. What does this mean? The word here means buying up things. So buying up time is what Paul means. Something like you would buy up stocks that you feel like are going to take a swing the other direction, or buying up real estate and you're waiting for the the market to to tick back up, buying up time. So what this means is buying up opportunity for you to share the gospel. So not letting any opportunity pass. There's a young lady in our congregation uh, who works at a school. And she went with us on a mission trip this year. uh, And her school has asked her to present about this mission trip. It's not a Christian school. It's a secular school. It's a school that just wants to hear about what she did over the summer. So she has an opportunity to present the gospel to an entire group of people. And what is she doing? She's taking the opportunity. She's making the most of the opportunity that she's been given while at the same time praying and having others pray about that situation with her. We need to speak the gospel. We need to be clear about what the gospel is. A lot of us think, uh, based on a, a St. Francis of Assisi quote that may not even be from him, that you, what, Speak the gospel, and if necessary, use words. That's all well and good. But if you don't ever use words, that's like trying to convince a neighbor that their house is on fire by bringing them to your house and showing them how your house isn't on fire. (laughs) Like, see how it's not burning down? I think you may have a problem. No, go take them to their house. Grab a bucket. (laughs) We have this odd way of thinking. And I think the reason why is because we're a little embarrassed. And I don't think, honestly, most of us are embarrassed of the gospel. I don't. And it's taken me a while to kind of sort through this. Sometimes I'm just embarrassed of the perception that people have of my tradition, of how Christians have portrayed themselves in America. But if I walk wisely, and if I am guided by wisdom, and if I show over time that I'm guided by the truth of the gospel and the wisdom that comes from it, And the things that James talks about here, you know what I think is going to happen? I think I don't have anything to be ashamed about. Let's keep reading. Because how do I speak wisdom and the truth of the gospel into people's lives without driving them away? Without coming across maybe as that person that I don't want to be? I think we give grace. We need to give grace. Let's keep reading in verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to you ought to to answer each person. If you're going to live lives of faith, if you're going to live a life following Jesus every day, one of the most important things that you need to do is to learn who Jesus is. It seems kind of like a no-brainer, but if your perception of Jesus is this strict taskmaster who rescued you from the slavery of sin in order to take you into the slavery of following every whim that he has, if that's your perception of who Jesus is, that is the perception that you will give to the rest of the world. The way you talk about him will be the way that you know him. On the other hand, if you view Jesus as kind of soft and cuddly, like a Winnie the Pooh, uh, who doesn't really care what you do, he died on the cross because, well, he just kind of owed you one because you're such a good person, that is the way that you will portray him to the rest of the world. And people honestly won't respect the Jesus that you serve. And honestly, they won't respect you either for the beliefs that you have. But if Jesus to you is the God of the gospel... 100% God and 100% man. The Lion of Judah and the Passover Lamb at the same time 
A God who calls you to rest and trust totally in him while at the same time being fully obedient to him, not for salvation, but out of worship and because you're responding to the grace that he's given you in your life. If you show that Jesus to people, guess what? Not only do you look right and look consistent in your faith, I think they want it. I think they're hungry for it and I think they're starving for it and they don't even know it. The Jesus that you portray to the rest of the world is the Jesus that you know. So spend time getting to know him. If you want to engage the culture around you, you need to engage the Savior and the God who created the culture in the first place. This is what seasoned with salt is. This is what it means to be seasoned with salt. This word means witty and winsome. Now some of you might think I'm not witty nor am I winsome. You're selling yourself short. Do you have a friend... Do you have two friends? Do you have more than one friend? If you have a friend, somebody out there somehow finds you witty and winsome. Whatever you do is you engage the culture around you, and that's what we're talking about, cultural engagement. We have to be gracious in our speech. Our tone has to be gracious. Why do we expect non-Christians to live as Christians? Why do we expect... That Christianity, because it's had it's had its run of the cultural table for most of American history, that now in the 21st century we should still run the table. Brothers and sisters, that's not the case anymore. We don't run the cultural table anymore. We're one of many voices, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Some good, some bad. But a lot of us, what we've done is, we've said, well, if we can't have control of the discussion at the cultural table, we're going to take our toys and go home. That's not cultural engagement. That's going and retreating into the lost world and hoping that the storm will pass you by. If we're going to be exiles in a society that increasingly finds our ways to be alien and in some ways confusing, we have to have a gracious speech and not get frustrated when people don't understand. And on top of that, don't be embarrassed. God has chosen you out of the rest of the world to be his peculiar people. Part of being a peculiar people is being peculiar, being odd, being strange. But that doesn't mean we retreat. It means that we engage with grace, love, mercy, those around us. So I need to be wise, yes. I need to be gracious, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, one theologian said, Paul envisages a church that is expected to hold its own in the social setting of the marketplace, the bathhouse, or for us it'd be like the gym, the meal table, and to win attention by the attractiveness of its life and speech. That's Paul's expectation on the church. Do we have the same expectation of our church? Or are we just trying to get through the week without a negative news story? Where we can shake our head and be like, that's not what we believe. That's not what we think. We need to be wise, we need to be gracious, but to what end? We need to serve our city. That's what the end is. We need to serve our city. I want us to go over to Jeremiah 29, 11, or 29, not 29, 11. I said we weren't going there. Almost lied to y'all, I'm sorry. Jeremiah 29, 1. I'm going to set the stage for you as we dive into this chapter, and I want to see if this sounds familiar to you. The setting is ancient Babylon, which is the preeminent empire of the day. They rule most everything and are in solid control. They're the superpower of the day. And there's some, a little bit of unrest, social and political unrest throughout the empire. So a lot of people being angry and, and sort of violence cropping up all over the place and the common people are concerned. And in the midst of all of this, the Jews have been exiled from their homeland throughout Babylon. And some of their leaders are saying, look, this is our time. This is a critical cultural moment where if we rise up and contribute to the anger and the violence going on, if we do that, we might get what we want, which is to go back home. And in the midst of this scenario, in the midst of this setting, Jeremiah, the prophet of God, writes a letter to the exiles, and it starts in verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And he's about to tell them that what they think is not right. What they think 
about joining in all this unrest and trying to go back home is not what God has for them. In fact, what God has for them is 70 years in exile, and that's where Jeremiah 29, 11 shows up. He says, my plans for you is that you're going to die in exile, and your kids are going to come back. That's his plan. So be careful when you quote the verse. Just throwing that out. It's kind of important. But he's saying you need to be fully invested in the city where I'm going to have you because you're going to be there a long time. So let's look at how we serve our city. First, we need to take a leadership role. Look at verse 2. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother and the eunuchs and the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. So what they just said is, Jeremiah is writing a letter to a bunch of people who've had their leadership cut off. The king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials, all of them are gone. So they're kind of in a leadership vacuum. And what he's about to tell them is, you guys have to step up. And that's what I'm telling you right now. Don't wait on your leaders and your city and your community to tell you what it needs. Go find out what it needs and then make it happen. We have a lot of resources in our church. The church in Dallas, and I mean that with a capital C, has a lot of resources. We have good partnerships with nonprofits and with other churches throughout our city that we can make a difference. All we have to do is find out what those needs are and go and make it happen. Don't wait for me or for Jeff or for other pastors to tell you where to go. Go. You have the mandate. Go. Go and do it. Take a leadership role. We're down in Cornerstone. We're, we're in Vickery. We're at Jack Lowe Elementary. We're in all sorts of places. Find a place to serve. Next, and this one might be hard for some of y'all, work with the government. Verse 3. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is a big bad guy. He came in, he destroyed uh, the temple of God, burned it to the ground. He is very much the anti sort of God figure in the Old Testament, one of them. And what he's called throughout Scripture. Do you know what God gives him, what title God gives him? Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Romans 13 talks about the government is put in place, the authority that we have is put in place so that it will rule with authority. It is an extension of God's authority on earth. Now, you don't have to agree with everything the government does. In fact, there are times where resistance is good and right and proper. Pretty sure our country is founded on that. But there is nobody, I think, you can disagree with me, who's ever taken office in our country who is every single idea they have is bent on evil and destruction. And the other hand, not everything they do is 100% good. Just because they have a D or an R next to their name doesn't make them 100% right or 100% wrong. It makes them appointed by God. And so what we need to do is we need to find places where we can work with them And resist on places where we can't. Speak our minds on that. Absolutely. Wisely, graciously, peacefully. But we need to help and work with our government when they call out needs that they have. I think a great example of this is what's going on in South Texas right now. The government is coming in and and trying to relieve some of the disaster that's taken place with Hurricane Harvey. And we support the Texas Baptist men. And guess what? They're down there now. They've left and, and are going to help. We, we give money to, to the Texas Baptist for that reason. And one of the side effects that has happened off as an offshoot, and this is kind of side note, um, if you know me, I love chasing rabbits, so here we go. <laughs> one of the side effects of that is uh, we support also the BSM at UTD. And they have their big annual, like, welcome back to school, they call it a fajita feed. And the people that serve there are the Texas Baptist men, and it was happening Tuesday. It, it is happening Tuesday. But the Texas Baptist men have had to pull out, rightfully so, to go to help with disaster relief. And so they're looking for volunteers. If you're available on Tuesday, help out. Serve a fajita. It's actually a lot of fun. I go up there all the time. Help out. You can, if you want information on that, you can meet me in the response room. I hope you get it. You can look it up on their website. But that is another way that you can indirectly help with what's going on in South Texas. Next, we need to invest in our city physically. Verse 5, build houses and live in them. What does this mean? It means don't like build shacks or put up tents. It means get yourself firmly established. Make this your home 
A lot of us are transplants. I get that. I am. I'm not from Dallas originally. Make this your home. Make this the place where you, you decide I'm going to give. I'm going to pour into this place. Build a house and live in it. Spend time here. Let's build up our neighborhoods and our city and make it the best city it possibly can be. And then let's invest in the city's needs. The, the back half of verse 5, plant gardens and eat their produce. You know what I see when I see that? Contribute to the economy. So they're being told to contribute to the economy of their enemy. Because who's going to buy the produce? Who's going to eat the produce? Both people from their country and people who are Babylonians, the enemy. We need to contribute to society. We need to spend time identifying the needs that our country and our city has and giving to them. Maybe some of these are spiritual needs. Be a disciple maker. Be somebody who pours into the lives of other people. And that takes us to our next point. Verse 6, we need to increase. Take wives and have sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. You know what this echoes? This echoes to me Genesis 128 where God tells all of creation or all of man to be fruitful and to multiply. Now for some of us, you read this and you think this means to have kids. It could be, sure. You make disciples out of your kids, absolutely. But I think being fruitful and multiply means making disciples for the believer, whether you have children or not. Pour into the lives of people who are young. Pour into the lives of people that are around you. Make disciples. Increase, don't decrease. Dallas is your every single day mission field. You don't have to go anywhere to find a mission field. You're in one right now. So increase. Then let's focus on the city. Verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. You know what I think is funny about this? He doesn't say seek the welfare of Babylon, like the empire. Don't seek the welfare of the nation or the, or the country you're going in. Seek the welfare of the city. Because of the 24-hour news cycle, I mean, you can turn on, like literally, you can be plugged into news all day long. And why you would want to do that, I have no idea. It is beyond me. But you can be if you want to be. And what does it call your attention to? Does the 24-hour news cycle call your attention to local problems and local concerns that you might actually be able to make a difference about? Or does it call your attention to national problems and national concerns that you might be able to make a difference in, but on a much smaller scale? We get distracted by national politics. We get distracted by national concerns and issues. We should be people that are concerned with what's going on in our nation. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is not at the expense of what our city needs, what our community needs, what the people closest to us need. I can make a bigger impact in Dallas than I can in Washington, D.C. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why Jeremiah, or God through Jeremiah, tells the exiles, hey, focus on the city. Last, let's pray for the city. Pray, for, pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, you will find your welfare. The city needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way that's going to be presented is if we bring it and if we pray that it would, be, that it would happen. We cannot keep silent in our community. The good news of Jesus Christ is what makes us a church. Do you know we wouldn't all be together on Sunday morning if it wasn't for the gospel? I wouldn't see or know most of you. I don't live in your neighborhood. We don't cross paths. We don't work in the same job. I guess I wouldn't need to find another job. We don't see each other outside of the bonds of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus Christ pulling us together. And I like most of you. So let's bring more people here. Let's invite more people into the gospel. In our city, we need to walk and be wise. Some of you might feel like exiles. Some of you might feel like you're constantly at a table where you have to explain who you are and you're a little like, ah, I hope they don't think I'm like this person or that person. Don't worry about that, brothers and sisters. Don't be ashamed. No that if you walk in wisdom and your words are guided by the grace that you find in Jesus Christ, you can serve our city. And I would argue that you can serve our city better than anybody else can because we have something that nobody else does and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power to transform lives, transform communities, and you know what? It's transformed my life. And that's the best that I can give somebody. So let's all commit together to serve our city 
and to serve our communities. We follow Jesus every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, you are gracious to us, and I know that you're gracious to us because I'm staring out at a whole bunch of people who worship you as Lord and as King. We don't have to do our Christian faith by ourselves. We don't have to serve by ourselves. And there's a whole world that needs to hear the gospel. And not just that, they have actual, physical, real needs even beyond the gospel that they need and that they need to have met. And so I pray that you would give us open eyes and open ears to hear and to see what they need and to meet those needs. God, I pray that you would work in this time as we take communion, that maybe for those people in this room who feel far off would be drawn close by the bread and the cup. And I pray that you would speak into our lives as we remember. I pray all this in your son's name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.